He was wealthy and he was powerful and he had cash. And he'd say, well, just remember, there's no one that I can't buy or destroy. I've often said that people have asked me, do you think they killed this man? And my answer is a very, I believe, fair one. Yes, they did. If you've been a longtime subscriber on my channel, then you've heard the name Howard Hughes so many times, right? Is this a name that keeps popping up with all these starlets? It seems like he was with everybody from Marilyn Monroe, Ava Gardner, even had tried to get Elizabeth Taylor to marry him when she was a teen. He tried to pay her a million dollars to marry him, right? But she was a teen and she declined. Uh, he offered Elizabeth Taylor $1 million tax-free if she would marry him. But Elizabeth, who was very uh, young at the time, got you, I think she's still in her teens. She turned him down. He just had his hands in everything, and we're gonna get deeper into that in the video, but the movie The Aviator with Leonardo DiCaprio it is based on him, right? There's so many other movies based on him, like Tony Stark, <laughs> yes, The Iron Man, yeah, it was based on him. Also Batman and so many other films where you have the rich billionaire that just goes into crime fighting and have other quests out there. That was definitely Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes had his hands in everything. He was not only an inventor who invented the mechanical beds in the hospital that you see with the buttons on the side because he was hospitalized for some time and was annoyed with the beds and decided to just invent something. While he was in the hospital, they didn't have automatic beds. And Howard designed the automatic bed in the hospital where you can raise the feet or the head or the middle of it. Whatever the hell you want to do, the controls are at the beds and those hosp all the hospitals have those beds now and how design that bed. He was just out here doing side quests. He partnered with the CIA, he worked with the government and it even got to the point where he was even helping decide who would be our next president and funding whoever he wanted to be next president, he would back them up 100%. So he was a powerful, powerful man. And when you have this much power, there will always be people that want to take that power from you. That's gonna come after you. And Howard Hughes had a lot of enemies along the way. He was called for Senate hearings. Papers say that you're going back to Washington, is that correct? Yes, uh, I'm going there to testify before Senator Brewster's War Investigating Committee. Uh, as you know, the committee has caused quite a stir by its investigation of my two airplane projects. So I ask you this question again, Senator Brewster. During my last trip to Washington, and while we were having lunch in your suite at the Mayflower Hotel, did you or did you not offer to call off this entire investigation. He had a lot of other billionaires also was competing with him who didn't want him to monopolize all of Vegas, etc. His story just goes so deep. And I really do think, I'm one of those conspiracy theorists that really think that, hmm, maybe he was taken out of here or he faked his death because the latter part of his life, no one ever saw him until he just showed up dead. We're gonna get into all of the conspiracies of his life, but we are going to start from the very beginning, which is his childhood. But before we get into all of that, hey friend, welcome to my channel, Kareen Allude, where we deep dive and break down the most iconic stars through history. If you're not yet subscribed, please be sure to do so. And if you're already subscribed, please turn on your notification bell so you never miss an upload. Without further ado, let's hop right in. Born as the only child of Aline Stone Gano and Howard R. Hughes Sr on December 24th, 1905, Howard Hughes' father was a prosperous inventor and businessman from Missouri. Howard had an impressive lineage. He was of English, Welsh, and French descent and was related to John Gano, the minister who supposedly baptized George Washington. Through family connections, he was even distantly related to the Wright brothers, pioneers of air travel who successfully made the first airplane, right? His father, Hughes Sr., patented a revolutionary tool in 1909 that opened up new possibilities for petroleum drilling. Instead of selling this invention outright, the savvy businessman chose to lease it, earning several, several early patents and set up the Hughes Tool Company. This venture brought immense wealth to the Hughes family. They were filthy rich. Howard's uncle, Rupert Hughes, was a well-known novelist, screenwriter, and film director. At the end of his birth, polio outbreaks were common, and his mother was terrified that, you know, Howard would somehow contract polio so she went to disturbing lengths to protect him. She kept him mostly isolated from the outside world and the young Hughes had no friends growing up. And a lot of us think that this is one of the reasons why he became a germaphobe OCD in his later life. His mother was a very powerful influence on him. Uh, partly, I think, as much as anybody helped instill this sort of lifelong phobia, fear anyway, of germs. 
Hughes had a pretty lonely childhood and then things got real scary. One day out of the blue, when he was a teen, Hughes couldn't walk anymore, like at all. Docs checked him out, but couldn't officially figure out why he was paralyzed. Years later, folks guessed it might've been from stress, which kind of makes sense considering how he was always super paranoid and obsessive from his mom, you know, with the whole polio thing. So just out of nowhere, stress paralyzed him. This is just a sad foreshadowing of how his life would end. From a young age, Howard displayed a keen interest in science and technology. He exhibited remarkable engineering skills. And at just 11 years old, he built Houston's first wireless radio transmitter. By 12 years old, he had constructed a motorized bicycle from his father's steam engine parts. Despite his lackluster academic performance, Howard had a love for mathematics, flying, and mechanics. He took his first flying lesson at 14. After a short time at the Thatcher School, Hughes attended Caltech, focusing on math and aeronautical engineering. However, tragedy struck when he was just 16, as his mother, Aline, passed away due to complications from an ectopic pregnancy. He was devastated, you know, because despite what his mother put him through, she showered him with a lot of love, affection, and attention, and he was just 16 years old. And two years later, at 18, his father succumbed to a heart attack. These losses inspired Howard to establish a medical research laboratory. Howard inherited 75% of the family fortune at the death of his parents. In addition to his other talents, Howard was an avid golfer who played with professionals. Like he was really, really good, but eventually he had other interests. Howard dropped out of Rice University after his father's death and married Elba Botts Rice, the daughter of David Rice and Martha Lawson Botts of Houston, who were the founders of Rice University. He relocated to Los Angeles, where Howard aimed to make a mark in the film industry. Now let's talk about how he made all his money. And I'm not going to lie, this part might be a little boring if you're not like into nerdy super stuff, but it's really cool. Cool. Because to me, I think like, wow, he did a lot. We're going to talk about how he became the richest man of his era. After his foray into engineering and aviation, Hughes turned his attention to filmmaking. His movies, Everybody's Acting, and Two Arabian Nights were big hits in the box office. The latter even bagged the first ever Academy Award for Best Director of a Comedy Picture. But Hughes didn't stop there. He poured a whopping $3.5 million into creating the aviation film Hell's Angel, starring Gene Harlow, which I did a video for. The movie was a sensation and even got an Academy Award nomination for Best Cinematography. Hughes hit another home run with Scarface. However, this film had its share of drama before it could hit the screens as the censors were concerned about its violent contents, you know, the killings and all of that. Eh, yeah, it was a lot. But he ended up having a lawsuit against the censors and won and was able to show the film in its all entirety. His movie, The Outlaw, featuring Jane Jane Russell, which I did a video for also, faced a similar issue, but this time it was because of Jane Russell's, you know, tatas being a fixture. And I talk a little bit more in depth about this in Jane Russell's video and how he created this bra for her to make her tatas stand up. It was a lot. The movie only saw a nationwide release in 1946. He couldn't really fight the censors for that movie. In 1948, Hughes made a bold move by buying RKO, a major Hollywood studio that was going through a rough patch. He bought it from Floyd Odlum's Atlas Corporation for a cool $8 million, $8.8 .8 million to be exact. But the takeover wasn't as smooth as you'd imagine. Hughes fired 700 employees soon after, and the studio productions dropped drastically from an average of 30 films per year to just nine in the first year under Hughes. Hughes then put the studio on a six-month hiatus during which he investigated the political beliefs of every remaining employee. He only allowed films to be reshot if he was sure that the stars under contract had no suspicious affiliations. This was particularly true for the women working at RKO. If Hughes felt that his star's political views didn't align with his or if a film's anti-communist politics weren't clear enough, he would cancel the project. Hughes was also responsible for firing a large number of RKO employees, whom he suspected were communists. Hughes was such a staunch anti-communist, he appeared at the Hollywood American Legion post to make a rare speech denouncing communism. And also, anytime he saw a gorgeous model, whether she won Miss America or something, and even if they had no talents, he would just sign them and give them a contract to RKO and put them in a nice house, give them a driver and, you know, an allowance and stuff, never really using them for any films. And he had a lot of gorgeous women where he just kept them like that. And they would just be waiting by the phone and he'd probably call them like once a month or something. And 
they'd be in these nice apartments just living lavishly. He would do that, yeah. During his tenure at RKO, Hughes began the curious practice of luring hundreds of potential starlets to Hollywood with promises of fame and fortune. If you'd see a picture of a beautiful girl who would want to miss America or something, he'd bring her here, do a test with her in a studio, stash her in a bungalow, and she could stay there for 10 years and the bungalows were paid for. Set them up in apartments and give them cars to drive, but she might never ever go back to the studio again. If, if they did have something, he'd give them a chance, but most of the girls were not very artistically inclined. I guess they were just beautiful girls. By 1954, Hughes had almost complete control over RKO, which cost him nearly $24 million. This made him the first person since the silent film era to solely own a major Hollywood studio. But just six months later, he sold it to the General Tire and Rubber Company for $25 million. Even though he retained the rights to the films he personally produced, including those made at RKO, this marked the end of Hughes' 25 year stint in the film industry. However, Hughes' financial acumen remained unscathed. He reportedly made a profit of $6.5 million from his time at RKO. And according to his close associate, Noah Dietrich, he was made a 10 million profit from selling the theaters. And that was a lot of money back then, okay? But let's not forget Hughes' love for aviation. He survived four airplane accidents, crashes, where he even crashed into neighborhood, okay? But he survived it and even started the Hughes Aircraft Company in 1932. He was obsessed with testing out his own planes and inventions. That's why he had so many crashes. He was so passionate about the industry that he went and worked undercover as a baggage handler for American Airlines under the pseudonym Charles Howard. So he was just pretending to be a regular man working as a bag handler because he wanted to learn the ins and out of the airline business. He was really passionate about it. He was promoted to co-pilot before his real identity ended up being discovered and then you know it created too much of a chaos so he had to quit. During and after World War II, Hughes transformed his company into a major defense contractor. And among other things, Hughes Aircraft Company produced spacecraft vehicles, military aircraft, radar systems, the first working laser. That's a huge deal, okay? Aircraft computer systems, missile systems, ion propulsion engines for space travel, commercial satellites, and other electronic systems. The company's helicopter division was started in 1947. Through all these ventures, Hughes made a significant mark on the aviation, airlines, aerospace, and defense industry. Let's get into more of his money moves because every move he did just attracted more money to him. He had the Midas touch. In 1948, Howard Hughes, a man of many talents and interests, delved into the space race with the creation of the Hughes Aerospace Group. This arm of Hughes aircraft became the launch pad for two more divisions in the same year, the Hughes Space and Communications Group and the Hughes Space Systems Division. Over the years, these divisions evolved into the Hughes Space and Communications Company, which was established in 1961. And an unexpected twist, he was made a generous move in 1953, which was not so generous because it was self-serving. He donated all his stocks into the Hughes Aircraft Company to the newly formed Howard Hughes Medical Institute. This act turned an aerospace and defense contractor into a tax-exempt charitable organization. He did everything to avoid paying taxes, which included never really buying a home and staying in hotels and moving from country to country, city to city, state to state, he just did not like to pay taxes and he would do whatever to avoid paying taxes. On December 17th, 1953, Hughes founded the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, although it is questioned whether this was for strictly humanitarian reasons. He solved all of his problems by creating this tax-exempt charitable organization. And the really interesting part, of course, is that the taxpayers pick up the bill for it. Flash forward to 1985, and the then Howard Hughes Medical Institute sold Hughes Aircraft to General Motors for a whopping $5.2 billion. The story doesn't end there, though. In 1997, General Motors passed the baton to Raytheon by selling Hughes Aircraft. Three years later, they also sold Hughes Space and Communications to Boeing. Together, Boeing, GM, and Raytheon took over the Hughes Research Laboratory. These labs were the epicenter of advanced developments in microelectronics, information and system sciences, materials, sensors, and photonics. They focused on everything from basic research to product delivery, which with special emphasis on high-performance integrated circuits, high-power lasers, antennas, networking, and smart materials. Mm. Now let's take a detour and talk about Hugh's personal achievements, because on top of that, he had time for some more side quests. On July 14, 1938, Hughes made 
history by flying around the world in just 91 hours. That's three days and 19 hours and 17 minutes to be exact. He beat the previous record of 186 hours set by Wiley Post in 1933. Hughes reached home even before photographs of his flight did. His goal was to showcase that long distance air travel was not only possible, but also safe thanks to US aviation and technology. He was putting the United States on the map. I think the United States owes a great debt of gratitude to Mr. Howard Hughes for conceiving and for constructing this great plane. It's one of the most valuable contributions to aeronautical science, I believe, which has ever been made and will be of inestimable value, not only to aviation, but I believe eventually to the country's security. His feat earned him a ticker tape parade in New York City's Canyon of Heroes. There was this large celebration parade for him. Though he was shy and timid, he had to sit there and endure all of that, but he wasn't a guy for like the parades and stuff. Hughes and his crew also received a 1938 Collier Trophy for their record-breaking flight. In 1938, the Houston Municipal Airport in Texas was renamed after Hughes. However, the public wasn't too happy about it airport being named after a living person and the name was soon changed back. Now let's fast forward to 1972. During the Cold War era, Hughes was approached by the CIA to help recover the Soviet submarine K-129, which had sunk near Hawaii four years earlier. The CIA used Hughes' involvement as a cover story to carry out their secret mission. The recovery plan involved the special purpose salvage vessel Glomer Explorer. In the summer of 1974, the ship attempted to raise the Soviet vessel. Unfortunately, a mechanical failure caused half of the submarine to break off and fall back to the ocean floor. This section is believed to have contained the most valuable items, including its code book and nuclear missiles. And despite the setback, two nuclear tip torpedoes, some cryptographic machines, and the bodies of six Soviet submariners were recovered. And although Hughes lent his name and his company's resources to the operation, he and his companies did not participate in the project. Now let's get into his relationships before we talk about his later years. In 1929, after four years of marriage, Howard Hughes' wife, Ella, decided she had enough, she packed her bags and headed back to their hometown of Houston and filed for divorce on the grounds of mental cruelty. But don't feel too sorry for Hughes. His love life was far from over and he was known to have quite the soft spot for Hollywood starlets. The list of his romantic interests read like a who's who's of Tim's Hotel. The dashing and charismatic Hughes dated some of the most famous women of his time and they were in love with him because he was tall, he was wealthy, he was intelligent until of course they got to know him and they was like, oh, he's a little, you know, he was different, let's just say that, but he was a very handsome man. Yes, he was a very shy around woman, but he had more women than anyone. I think he had more women than Errol Flynn. And of course, he had no trouble having dates because everyone knew who he was and everyone liked him. That guy could jitterbug, Latin dance, anything. He was fantastic. But a lot of people in Hollywood used him also because of his money. There was always saying, oh, he's the guy with the checkbook, you know. He, he wasn't one to be taken advantage of, but he did love to splurge because he was a very strong, forceful man. If you hear some of his hearings, he was talking back to these governors like, I own you. And there's a quote he says that says, every man has a price. If they didn't, I wouldn't be in the position I am now. So he was known to buy off people also, but let's continue. So Joan Crawford, the queen of Hollywood, was one of his many conquests. The stunningly beautiful Deborah Page also caught his eyes, as did the enchanting Billy Dove and the exotic Faith Domergu. He charmed the legendary Betty Davis, which I did videos for, and the sultry Ivan Di Carlo, which I did videos for also. He even managed to sweep the breathtaking Ava Gardner, one of my favorites, I did a video for her too, off her feet. And they have the same birthday. They were born on the same day. And that's not all. Hughes also romanced the elegant Olivia de Havilland and the fiercely independent Catherine Hepburn, which I did a video for. The glamorous Hedy Lamar, which I did a video for. <laughs> I did a video for all these people. There's only a few, but don't worry. They're all are already on my list before you request. And the vivacious Ginger Rogers were among his paramours too. Society Harris, Gloria Vanderbilt, Bombshell Mammy Van Doren, I did a video for her. And the ethereal Jean Tierney, which I did a video for her, also fell under his spell. John Fontaine must have found something special in Hughes because according to our autobiography, No Bed of Roses, he proposed to her multiple times, but it seems Hughes wasn't always smitten with every starlet he encountered. 
Ford. Gene Harlow, the original blonde bombshell, accompanied him to the premiere of his movie Hell's Angel. However, according to Noah Dietrich's 1971 book, Hughes wasn't personally fond of Harlow. He didn't like her personality. So it was strictly like a business relationship. One woman Hughes held in high regard was Jane Russell. He, he was really like, he was really trying to bed her, okay? And although Dietrich claimed that Hughes never sought a romantic relationship with her, which I don't know, Russell's autobiography tells a different story. Like I said, I did a video for her detail on all of this, so check that out. She recounted an incident where Hughes tried to get intimate with her after a party. The married Russell turned him down and Hughes promised it would never happen again, but they did maintain a friendship, both professional and personal for many years, because one thing he did, he he respected women who said no. The more resolve he had, he respected it because he was interested in the chase, as was stated. He was a man that was interested in the chase, but once he had you, he just was no longer interested. So the women he stayed friends with, like Hedy Lamar, Jean Tierney, and Jane Russell, um, which I did videos for all of them, they were women that actually had personalities, with Hedy Lamar being the most intelligent, whom he loved Hedy Lamar also. And Jane Russell was just not having it. She had some kind of morality to her, right? Every woman he got with, he would try to marry them. He would promise marriage to them, never really doing it, but it was always the case. Unfortunately, I, the one trait in Howard that I never liked, and I liked this man very much, but he always told every girl he ever went with that he was going to marry her. Why the hell he said that, I don't know. Jean Tierney, another of Hughes' friends, once jokingly said, I don't think Howard could love anything that did not have a motor in it. But when Tierney's daughter, Daria, was born with severe disabilities due to Tierney's exposure to rubella during her pregnancy, Hughes showed his softer side. He ensured that Daria received the best medical care and even covered all the expenses. It goes to show that beyond the Playboy image, Hughes had a heart capable of kindness and generosity. And I do talk about in that in Jean's video also. Now, January 12, 1957, he was married actress Jean Peters at a small hotel in Tanopa, Nevada. The couple met in the 1940s before Peters became a film actress. They had a highly publicized romance in 1947, and it was talks of marriage. Some later claimed that Peters was the only woman Hughes ever loved, and he reportedly had his security officers follow her everywhere, even when they were not in a relationship. And nowhere, I'm gonna do a video for her soon too. Now, let's talk about this car accident that was like, mm. On a fateful night on July 11, 1936, Howard Hughes was involved in a chilling incident. While driving his car at the intersection of 3rd Street and Lorraine in Los Angeles, he accidentally hit a pedestrian named Gabriel S. Mayer. Unfortunately, Mayer didn't survive the accident. Hughes was immediately taken to the hospital for examination. Although the doctors certified him as sober, one of them noted that Hughes might have had a drink or two earlier. Meanwhile, an eyewitness who saw the accident unfold told the police that Hughes was driving in a zig zag pattern and way too fast for the area. And according to this witness, poor Meyer had been standing safely in the designated zone for streetcar passengers. The police arrested Hughes, suspecting him of causing Meyer's death due to negligent driving. He spent a night in jail until his lawyer, Neil S. McCarthy, managed to get a writ of habeas corpus. This legal move allowed Hughes to be released from jail while they waited for a coroner's inquest into Mayer death. However, as the inquest approached, the witness did a complete change with their story, right? He claimed that it was Meyer who had suddenly moved directly in front of Hughes' car. And on July 16, 1936, after hearing all the testimony, the coroner's jury concluded their inquest. They decided that Hughes was not to blame for Meyer's unfortunate death. And after the inquiry, Hughes spoke to reporters saying, I was driving slowly and a man stepped out of the darkness in front of me, end quote. This event added yet another dramatic chapter to the life of Howard Hughes where people just thought, man, you kind of got away with killing this man because of your money and you got the witness to change their story. Comment below your thoughts, but... Mm. And then there's the Nixon scandal, right? Imagine it's 1960 and the presidential election is just around the corner. Richard Nixon, one of the candidates, is in for a shock. News breaks that his brother Donald has borrowed a hefty sum of $205,000, which was a lot during that time, from none other than Howard Hughes. Now, this wouldn't typically be a problem, but when you're running for the highest office, any whiff of scandal can be damaging, right? He thought the Democrats had gotten wind of the secret bribe. This wasn't just any bribe. 
described. Terry Lenzner, who served as the chief investigator for the Senate Watergate Committee, has an interesting theory. He believes that Nixon's desperation to find out what O'Brien knew about his ties with Hughes could have been one of the reasons behind the infamous Watergate break-in. It seems the specter of Howard Hughes continued to haunt Nixon, stirring up intrigue and scandal in the wake. Like I said, this man had his hands in everything. But let's talk about his grim last year. And according to Noah Dietrich, Hughes had peculiar eating habits. Every dinner was the same, a medium rare New York strip steak, a salad and peas, but not just any peas. Hughes only ate the small ones, pushing the larger ones aside. His breakfast was also specified. He demanded his eggs be cooked the way Lily, his family cook, used to make them. Hughes had a deep seated fear of germs and his obsession with secrecy bordered on mania. In 1958, Hughes decided he wanted to watch some movies at a film studio near his home. He ended up hunkering down in the studio's darkened screening room for more than four months without stepping foot inside. His diet during this period consisted only of chocolate bars, chicken, and milk. He surrounded himself with boxes of Kleenex, continuously stacking and rearranging them. His aides received explicit memos instructing them not to look at or speak to him unless he initiated it. Hughes spent this time sitting in his chair, often naked naked and gross in watching movies. When he finally emerged in the summer of 1958, his personal hygiene had taken a serious hit. He hadn't bathed, cut his hair, or trimmed his nails for weeks. After this incident, Hughes moved into a bungalow at the Beverly Hills Hotel. He also rented rooms for his aides, his wife, and his various girlfriends. He would sit naked in his bedroom with a pink hotel napkin placed over his genitals, watching movies. Hughes was a big spender at the hotel, shelling out an estimated $11 million in just one year. He started buying restaurant chains and four-star hotels that originated in Texas, transferring the ownership to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, which resold the licenses shortly after. Hughes developed an obsession with the 1968 film Ice Station Zebra, watching it on a continuous loop at home. His aides claim he watched watched it 150 times. Feeling, feeling guilty about the failure of The Conqueror, a film that flopped both commercially and critically, Hughes bought every copy of the film for $12 million and watched it repeatedly. Hughes had a habit of using tissues to handle objects to protect himself from germs. He would point out dust, stains, or any other imperfections on people's clothes and insisted they clean them. Once a public figure, Hughes disappeared from the public eye. Rumors about his health, mental state, and even death circulated in the tabloids. Hughes' later life was marked by pain due to injuries from several plane crashes, leading to an addiction to codeine. Howard Hughes, a wealthy tycoon in his later years, led an intriguing lifestyle. Accompanied by his personal aides, he hopped from one hotel to another always commanding the top floor penthouse for his residence. He lived in various cities, including Beverly Hills, Boston, Las Vegas, Nassau, Freeport, and Vancouver. On Thanksgiving Day, November 24, 1966, Hughes made a grand entrance into Las Vegas via a railroad car and took up residence at the Desert Inn. However, his refusal to vacate the hotel led to some tension with the owners. To resolve this, Hughes did what any billionaire would do. He bought the entire hotel in early 1967. The eighth floor of the Desert Inn became the nerve center of Hughes' empire, while the ninth floor penthouse served as his personal sanctuary. Between 1966 and 1968, Hughes went on a hotel casino buying spree, acquiring several properties, including the Castaways, New Frontier, the Landmark Hotel and Casino, and the Sands. He soon overstayed his welcome, as Desert Inn owners sought to regain control of their profitable high roller suites. They had given an instruction to the security guards that if Hughes was not vacated in 48 hours, that they would bodily come up to the ninth floor and kick him out of the hotel. We started negotiations and finally made the deal in March to acquire the hotel. Hughes embarked on a spending spree that resulted in the ownership of the Desert Inn, Sands, Castaways, Frontier, Silver Slipper, and Landmark Casinos. After Hughes' departure from the Desert Inn, staff made a shocking discovery. His drapes hadn't been opened during his stay and had completely rotted through due to lack of sunlight. Hughes had a vision for Las Vegas. He wanted it to shed its cowboy image and transform into a glamorous destination. He once wrote to an aide, I like to think of Las Vegas in terms of a well-dressed man and a dinner jacket. He even purchased several local television stations, including Class TV, to propagate this image. There was a small committee who 
ended up running everything for him called the Mormon Mafia due to a lot of Mormons being in there. And their leader was Frank William Gay. Initially, this group functioned as Hugh's personal secret police. Over time, however, they became a powerful entity managing Hugh's vast business interests, even collaborating with the CIA on a project to retrieve sensitive information from a sunken Russian submarine. These aides were not only responsible for Hugh's business operations, but also catered to his every whim, no matter how eccentric. For instance, when Hughes developed a liking for Baskin Robbins banana nut ice cream, his aides ordered a bulk shipment, only to find that the flavor had been discontinued. Undeterred, they placed a special order for the minimum quantity possible, a whopping 350 gallons. But just days after the ice cream arrived, Hughes decided he was bored of banana nut and demanded French vanilla instead. The Desert Inn ended up giving away the banana nut ice cream to casino customers for an entire year. Now, Hughes was no fan of nuclear testing, particularly not in his backyard at the Nevada test site. He was deeply worried about the potential risk of residual nuclear radiation and made numerous attempts to stop the test. However, despite his best efforts, the test proceeded and the impact was so powerful that Hughes could feel his hotel trembling from the shockwaves. In desperation, Hughes turned to those at the very top for help. He instructed his representatives to offer hefty bribes of $1 million each to President Lyndon B. Johnson and Richard Nixon, but even the allure of money couldn't sway them. I say Nevada is no longer so desperate for mere existence that it has to accept and swallow with a smile poisonous, contaminated radioactive waste material more horrible than human excrement. He made every effort, humanly possible, to stop the test in Nevada at the test site, but we were unsuccessful in that regard. And we had to stop pushing too hard because it was becoming embarrassing. These were genuine concerns, and, and he wrote memo after memo on these subjects and trying to get the test stopped. Unable to prevent the boxcar test, Hughes stepped up the battle and decided to garner support from whichever candidate would replace outgoing President Lyndon Johnson. He wanted me to see Richard Nixon as soon as possible and offer him unlimited help with his campaign because it was very important that he, Richard Nixon, be the next president of the United States. In order to cover all bases, Hughes attempted a last-ditch effort to appeal to President Johnson. Well, on two occasions, he wanted me to offer a million dollars to uh, then presidents to try to stop the underground testing. Around the same time in 1970, Hugh's wife, Jean Peters, filed for divorce. The couple had been living separate lives for many years. When Hughes and Peters did live together, they had separate refrigerators, and Peters had to put tissue in between Hugh's toenails since he refused to cut them and their clicking on the floor reached unbearable volumes. Peters asked for a lifetime alimony of 70000 annually, indexed to inflation, and gave up any claims to Hugh's vast estate. Hughes offered her a settlement exceeding a million dollars, but she turned it down. Interestingly, Hughes didn't require Peters to sign a confidentiality agreement as part of their divorce. And despite their split, he never spoke ill of her, and she maintained a dignified silence about their life together, rejecting lucrative offers to spill the beans. In 1972, an author named Clifford Irving stirred up a media storm when he claimed he had co-written an authorized autobiography of Hughes. Irving asserted that he had been in touch with Hughes through mail and produced handwritten notes supposedly from Hughes as proof. Publisher McGraw-Hill Inc. fell for the ruse thinking the manuscript was genuine. Hughes, known for his reclusive nature, didn't immediately deny Irving's claims, leading many to believe the book was authentic. But before the book hit the shelves, Hughes finally spoke up denouncing Irving in a teleconference with reporters he knew personally. Irving's elaborate hoax crumbled, leading to his indictment and subsequent conviction for fraud, leaving viewers questioning if it was really Hughes who took part in the teleconference. This mystery was fueled by the fact that very few people had seen or heard from Hughes in recent years. On April 5, 1976, at 1.27 p.m., Hughes passed away on board an aircraft. His reclusive lifestyle, coupled with possible substance use, had transformed him significantly. Once a tall and commanding figure, Hughes had become gaunt and frail, weighing barely 90 pounds. His hair, beard, fingernails, and toenails had grown long, and his body was barely recognizable. The FBI had to use fingerprints to confirm his identity. His body was flown to a morgue in Houston under the alias John T. Conover. On April 5, 1976, Hughes slipped into a coma. His body lay still, except for tremors in the muscles of his face. Hughes' personal physician was called to the penthouse, but instead of immediately attending to the comatose Hughes, he spent nearly two hours rummaging through the files kept in the suite. I have a feeling that there was a lot of this going on throughout the Hughes organization in those last days, and a lot of documents were being destroyed. Probably the most striking thing is, is, is this picture of a man who, who basically is all alone. I hate to think so, but I think he probably was very sad at the end. He had no more TWA, no more Spruce Goose, no more studio. 
You just had a lot of money. Four hours after the doctor arrived, Hughes was loaded into an air ambulance chartered for Houston, where arrangements had been made for a hospital admission. He looked almost dead when he boarded the airplane. You know, his eyes were wide open, and there was really very little life, at all, if any, left any month. As we uh, were taxiing into the customs ramp, the uh, doctor in the back said, just take your time, there's no need to hurry any longer. That's how we knew at that time. He uh, died, apparently, as we were descending into Houston. Just Can you imagine a man with seven broken hypodermic needles in his arm? A man who's responsible for having built the biggest medical foundation in the history of man. This is not the picture of someone who is being really cared for. I mean, a sore that oozes, a, a bone that's sticking out of his shoulder. And the question is why? I've often said that people have asked me, do you think they killed this man? And my answer is a very, I believe, fair one. Yes, they did. An autopsy revealed kidney failure as a cause of death. An 18-month investigation into Hughes' drug use found that he had been administered a fatal dose of painkillers while in a coma leading to his death. Despite severe malnutrition and numerous bed sores, his internal organs, including his brain, were found to be surprisingly healthy. X-rays revealed broken off hypodermic needles lodged in his arms, a grim testament to his struggles with addiction. When he died in 1976, it wasn't surprising that conspiracy theories sprouted up around the circumstances of his death. One such theory suggested that Hughes didn't die in 1976, but lived on under a different identity. Retired Major General Mark Music, a former Assistant Secretary of the Air Force, is one of the opponents of this theory, claiming that Hughes lived incognito until 2001, dying in Troy, Alabama on November 15th of that year. Music's source was Eva McClelland, who asserted that she had lived with Hughes for most of those 25 years. She described him as healthy and as always a recluse. According to her, Hughes used his connections with the CIA and Las Vegas Mafia to maintain his privacy. What about the images of a frail, severely underweight Hughes with overgrown nails? Music dismissed them as fake, suggesting they were of an imposter or a paid double. After Hughes' death, the distribution of his massive estate, estimated at $1.5 billion, became a matter of great contention. Despite being married twice, Hughes had no children, and initially no will was found, leading to numerous claims on his estate. Eventually, a will surfaced at the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Salt Lake City. According to this document, Hughes wished to divide his estates into 16 equal shares, with one share going to the church and another to a man named Melvin Dumar. Dumar's claim to share of the inheritance was based on a chance encounter in the Nevada desert in December 1958. He said he picked up a hitchhiker who claimed to be Howard Hughes. Many doubted Dumar's story, including Hughes' cousins, who contested the will's validity. The distribution of Hughes' estate it was a long, drawn-out process due to its complexity and the lack of an undisputed will. More than a thousand potential beneficiaries staked their claims. Finally, in 1983, Hughes' $2.5 billion estate was divided among 22 cousins, including William Loomis, who became a trustee of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. The Supreme Court ruled that the Hughes aircraft was owned by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, which sold it to General Motors in 1985 for $5.2 billion. Claims for inheritance tax by the states of California and Texas were rejected. And in 1984, Terry Moore, who claimed she had secretly married Hughes on a yacht in international waters of Mexico in 1949, and never divorced, received an undisclosed amount from Hughes' estate. Although she never produced proof of their marriage, her book, The Beauty and the Billionaire, detailing their relationship, became a bestseller, and people do believe, especially those who are close to him, that they were indeed married because Terry Moore was a virgin, and Hughes wanted to bed her so bad, but she was like, hey, I'm super religious. I will only go to bed with you if we get married. So, you know, they quickly forge a marriage, but he was like, hey, it's not a serious wedding. You know, it's not serious to him. So the official didn't really keep documents but to her it was and I guess that's why they ended up you know the his estate ended up paying that. Terry was a strict Mormon and uh, very religious and uh, when she was going with Hughes she's one of three Hollywood virgins in town. Terry told me she says I will not go to bed with Howard Hughes unless I'm married to him. So Howard you know had to skip her this yacht marry him and then he threw the, the log overboard <laughs> no record of it but I'm, I'm sure it happened because Howard would do anything to get Terry in bed. But this is so sad because this man you know, what got me with his story the most is that 
he though he was super rich he had a lot of villain ways and you guys will see and as i do more breakdowns for more starlets and past breakdowns that i've done for starlets you guys will see some of his character a lot of stuff i didn't put in this video because i already put it in other videos and we'll put it in more videos so i don't know whether to sympathize with him or you know but the human of me of course i sympathize just a little bit because i feel like from a very young age when you're born into such wealth you don't know what no means but he had this like cuckoo mother and a father who was money obsessed you know he came from wealthy wealthy circles he was isolated with no friends he was just kind of socially awkward which a lot of the starlets he dated described him as that but he was very intelligent i am in awe of his intelligence if i'll say that right how he just knew how to make money and which properties to buy and land he amassed lands and you know inventing stuff just out of sheer boredom he was 11 years old inventing things he made the first mechanical bicycle just driving around you know with nothing to do this man was a sheer genius but because of his money a lot of people just wanted that they wanted to be attached to him and in his last days it turned out he wasn't making any decisions for himself and a lot of people don't even believe he was even really alive i'm one of those people that don't believe he was alive in his last days of course i have no proof it's just speculation but i really believe the little mafia you know the latter day saints um, the mormon mafia they were really i think it was a uh, elaborate plot where they just made it seem like he was alive but they were making decisions on his behalf and taking his money and splitting it because a lot of his aides wouldn't even see him no one was seeing this man and quote unquote when y'all saw him he was unrecognizable if you go deeper into his story you will see that on his last days even his wife jane peters ended up divorcing him because she hadn't seen him in like three four years she was like uh-uh you know it was weird only on the phone and i think with a lot of the uh, inventions they were doing they could have easily manipulated um, a machine to sound like him or had people that sound like him because all of his business dealings was allegedly over the phone and he just didn't see some of his closest friends and this was a man who didn't really carry cash you know that's how wealthy he was he drove a regular car he didn't carry cash or anything and he never had a dime in his pocket never had any money He'd always borrow money. He never had any money on him. He never thought about money. It just came in, you know. When he'd work, he'd work maybe 48 to 60 hours at a time and then conk out. And he'd sometimes sleep in his car. He had the ch cheapest car you could buy. When I used to ride around with him, he had a Chevy. No radio. And I was driving with him once. And I says, Howard, with all your money, why the hell don't you get a Rolls Royce? And he says, who do I have to impress? So he did live most of his life humble in that regard with money, but what how he flaunt his money was he'll just purchase big buildings or you know but when he was in his best shape he would fund a lot of technological inventions aviation and medical research and stuff when he was in his best shape but i believe after so many accidents and crashes he probably mentally deteriorated and there was people that took advantage of that and they probably took his life i don't think that he faked his death though a lot of people think i think he faked his death he disappeared blah blah blah. i don't think so because he was known to get mentally overwhelmed with so many projects that he was doing that you know he would just avoid all of it at times and he would just disappear and go to an island when he was at his best and when he was still in the public eye he would just travel and get his mind off of stuff or do a big hollywood party or get a new girlfriend or something because he was always mentally exhausted with how many things he was doing to get the money I don't know. Overall, this story just taught me one thing. I thought, you know, when I was younger, I wanted to be the richest person on earth. I wanted to have my hands on all this. And doing stories like this and going deeper, you know, for the sake of YouTube, I'm not that type of channel to go too deep into the conspiracies, you know. I like living. <laughs> But one thing I noticed, I don't want the burdens of being rich, this type of rich. I, I don't want this type of rich. I want to be comfortable. I want to travel when I want to travel, you know, take care of myself and stuff. But this level of rich comes with a lot. It comes with a lot. And there's just a lot of hungry people and entities that were in this man's pockets. And I really don't think he had any autonomy in, the, in his last days. He really went crazy. You guys should check out the movie, The Aviator with Leonardo 
DiCaprio paying him is really great also. But wow, wow, wow. Comment below your thoughts. I know this one was pretty lengthy, but he just lived such a huge life and there's so much more that I didn't put in this video. It could really have been two hours if I wanted to, but I condensed it for you guys. So if you watch till the very end, oh, support my channel, thumbs up, engage, okay? Help me through the algorithm. I love you guys so much. Thank you for tuning in. If you like the music you're listening to, the link is in the description. Support my brother until next time.